Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. So you're going to need to take notes tonight. And I apologize, I meant to have a a slide up for you with some of these words, so I'm just going to have to spell them to you, because we had a rather distracted day around here, and <laughs> I did not get it done, but we've got the Word done. So I already started my notes, praise God, earlier in the week, and so we're prepared. I want to tell you my, uh, my tools that I used for tonight's message. I used the Strong's Concordance. I used the Vines Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. I use the Thayer's Greek Lexicon. So if you don't know the Thayer's, the Vines, and the Strong's, you're missing some valuable tools. They'll give you the, the Greek meaning of words. And if you need to know how to do that, there's a number of people in here. If you know how to study Greek words, raise your hand. Raise them high. That way the people around you can see, hey, I need help learning how to do this. Another thing that I use tonight that I haven't often mentioned since this is Bible study, I like to give you these things, is the Englishman's Concordance. Anybody else use the Englishman's Concordance? <gasps> Thank you. Um, it's a handy tool. I'm going to give you a for instance. We're going to look at the word death tonight in one of the, in one of the passages, and it is strong, uh, Strong's number 2288. So what I can do is I can go to the Englishman's Concordance on my computer, and I can put 2288 in there, and it will show me every time the word is used that way. Every scripture. So I did that a lot in this study that we're going to do on the word redeemed. Tonight is redeemed from the curse. So we're going to go to Galatians 3. Imagine that. I also talked with Alicia today. Y'all remember Alicia? <laughs> Marilyn does. And I talked with her about some of the newer things. I have the PC Study Bible program. It's on my computer. It's pretty expensive. She thinks there might be some online versions of it uh, that are a little cheaper. But I use the PC Study Bible program. I have all these tools along one side of the page. As I read a scripture, I can hit any one of these tools like that. I can also copy and paste them to my notes. So that's very valuable. But I, I text her because I had a guy asking me about what tools to use, and that's the only one I use, and I knew she and Travis would know some. And she said they also use Olive Tree. And she just started using one called blueletterbible.org. And some of you use those. You can pay for some add-on things if you want more, but there'll be some basic things there that are free. So just so you'll have those. Uh, to use. Galatians chapter 3, I'm going to be reading out of the Amplified, starting in verse 9. So then, those who, are people of, those who are people of faith are blessed and made happy and favored by God as partners in fellowship with the believing and trusting of Abraham. King James Version says, faithful Abraham. And all who depend on the law who are seeking to be justified by obedience to the law of rituals, are under a curse and doomed to disappoint and to destruction. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed or accursed and devoted to destruction and eternal punishment is everyone who does not continue to abide, live and remain by all the precepts, all the precepts, all the precepts and all the commands. This is the way the law worked. If you broke one law, you broke the law. There, there, we weren't under grace yet, folks. The Old Testament was not under grace. And so if you broke the law, you broke the law. You didn't just mess up. You, you, you stepped out from under God's umbrella protection that he, had, that he had made through the law. And there was consequences to it <clears throat> because the earth was cursed because say, uh, man had bowed his knee to a cursed God. So all the precepts, all the commands written in the book of the law and to practice them. Verse 11. Now it is evident that no person is justified, declared righteous and brought into right standing with God through the law. The law couldn't do it. 
The law simply told them they couldn't do it. They needed a savior. That's basically what the law did. It pointed out the sin of mankind. For the scripture says, the man in right standing with God, the just and the righteous, shall live by and out of faith. And he who through and by faith is declared righteous and in right standing with God shall live. The King James Version says it this way. You know it very well. The just shall live by faith. So the law was not going to provide this righteousness. It was a covering, but it was not a purchasing that we're going to talk about tonight. The law couldn't do it. And we don't, want to, we don't want to go back under the law of works. That's not where we want to be. We want under the law of grace. And it has freed us from the law of sin and death. Verse 12. But the law does not rest on faith. The law didn't rest on faith. It does not require faith. It has nothing to do with faith. For it itself says, he who does them, the things prescribed by the law, shall live by them and not by faith. We don't want to go back there. Verse 13 is really where we're going, but it's hard to, hard to catch the Apostle Paul taking a breath. Verse 13 says, Christ purchased our freedom, redeeming us from the curse, from the doom of the law and its condemnation, by himself becoming a curse for us, for it is written in the scriptures, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree and is crucified. To the end that through their receiving Christ Jesus, the blessing, the promise to Abraham might come upon the Gentiles so that we through faith might all receive the realization of the promise of the Holy Spirit. Christ has, King James Version, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, when it talks about the blessing of Abraham coming on the Gentiles here, that's kind of hard to nail down. And we can go back to Deuteronomy 28. Most of you know this. And um, you can study. The first part of Deuteronomy 28 talks about the blessings of the covenant that he made with Abraham. And the last part of, uh, I think it starts about verse 15 or so, starts talking about the curses. If you obey... This is what happens in the good. If you disobey, this is what happens. And you can read that. And I went through a lot of that this week and just kind of started making myself a list. It can be summed up pretty easily. If it's bad, it came from the curse. <laughs> if it was good, it came from the blessing. I mean, you can look at it, and it is good to look at it because I know Rusty was having a skin problem a couple months ago. And mom took him to Deuteronomy 28 to the curses where it talks about skin conditions. And just pointed out, that's under the curse. You know what that means? Christ redeemed you from that. It talks about your children being taken into captivity and you longing for the joy of your children and not having it. That's under the curse. You're redeemed from the curse. You have a right to the joy of your children. It talks about your mates cheating on you. That's under the curse. You've been redeemed from the curse. So if you're going through different situations, a lot of it had to do with a, a curse on prosperity. Death. I mean, there was just, there's so much in there. It's verse after verse after verse. And it's really hard to read because it's, it's pretty harsh. But that's what happened when Adam bowed his knee to a curse God. The curses came into the earth. They weren't here before. You have been redeemed from the curse. Is that going to bother y'all on camera if I set that there? Thank you. Don't tell Kevin. But when I looked up, I looked up some different things on the blessing of Abraham, and I thought this was a good summation, okay? It said, The blessing of being justified by faith and all the blessings consequent to that. That's a pretty simple way of saying what the blessing of Abraham was. The blessing of being justified by faith, which is how we're justified, and all the blessings that are consequent to that. If you're justified and you're right before God, what blessings are associated with that? All good things. All good things. All things that pertain to life and godliness. That's what Jesus died to give us. So we aren't redeemed from the blessing. We're redeemed from the curse. That the blessing that he made to Abraham did not end when the law was fulfilled. It wasn't part of the law. It was before the law, actually. 
And the blessings that came under the law weren't X'd out when Jesus fulfilled the law. The blessings continue. You're not redeemed from the blessings. You're redeemed from the curse. Nowhere does it say you're redeemed from the blessing. The blessing's Jesus and all that comes with him. So you're redeemed from the blessing and not redeemed. I'm sorry, you aren't redeemed from the blessing. You are redeemed from the curse. I hope I said that right. The word redeemed, let's look at it. Uh, there's several Greek words. We're not going to exhaust this tonight. We're not going to get through them all. We're just going to cover a few of the ones that are used the most. The word used in Galatians 3.13, where it said Christ has redeemed us from the curse. Ready for this spelling? Because my pronunciation in Greek is a little arkansand. So I'm going to spell it to you. It is E X A G O R. A Z O. Everybody got that? I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but this is what it means. Purchasing a slave from the slave market with a view of his freedom. Hmm. Has to do with the slave market. When there's actually more than one word that makes up that word, and one of those words is the slave market. And to put, to put it together, it means purchasing a slave from the slave market with a view of his freedom. Vines says that this word stresses the price paid. Now, I really like that because you weren't just rescued. You weren't just saved. You were legally purchased. Your debt was paid. You weren't stolen out of it. You didn't escape out of it. This is a legal act. And, and as we study Jesus coming into the earth, and as we go on into the, the crucifixion and everything, we're going we're gonna to learn, we're going to see that Jesus, did, he had to come as a man because this had to be done in a legal fashion. Man had bowed his knee to Satan, given up the authority. It would have to be a man that would come into the earth to take it back. And I, so I love when I read the vines, it's like, it stresses the price paid. That's important. We serve a legal God. He didn't just rescue you. You didn't just escape. You were legally purchased. Your debt was fully paid. And I love what one of the commentaries brought out because sometimes they take my mind a step further, Tina, than where it was before. <laughs> we really need to study more. And he said, it's not that Jesus or God paid a ransom or paid a debt to someone. He didn't buy you from someone. He didn't buy you from the devil. The debt of sin was owed to justice, to God. You remember what it says in Romans, I believe it's Romans 6, 8. I'm sorry, Romans 6, 23. The wages or the payment for sin is death. So the, the, the scales of justice were against us. We were under sin. We were in sin. We were born into a sin nature because of what Adam did. We won't get into all those scriptures today, but they're abundant. Uh, one man, one man's disobedience, many were made unrighteous. So the, the scales of, of justice had to be brought back up, and Jesus' blood is the only thing that would do that. And so... The wages of sin being death. I, I looked up that word death. This is one of those studies I talked about in the beginning. The wages or payment for sin is death. Some of these things, Thayer said this. He said the wages for sin is death. And that means all the miseries arising from sin. That's what death is. Death is the miseries that arise from sin. Vine said that death is separation of man from God. Then another one I found, I, this one was deep, I had to think on it a little bit. He said, it, death is the conscious existence in separation from God. The conscious existence, you're still existing, but you're existing conscious that you are separated from God. That's death. That's a bad day. That's where a lot of the world is. So the legal purchasing word redeem here that we found in Galatians 3. It's also found in Galatians 4. So if you want to turn there, we'll get another one in. 
on the EX word that I spelt out a while ago. I need Travis when I'm covering these words. We miss him, don't we? Galatians 4, 4. I'm reading out of the NIV. It says, When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. We covered this, I think, Sunday morning. He had to legally, fully pay our debt in order to redeem us, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave. Why? Because your debt has been paid. And you've got to understand, back in the Old Testament, even the New Testament, when they owed a debt and they couldn't pay it, they became a slave. See, we don't think that way, and we have to think back to when this was written and put ourselves in the time. They owed a debt, and they couldn't pay it. They would take their children as slaves. They would take them as slaves until that debt was paid. This is what this is talking about. Your debt has been paid, so you are no longer a slave, but now you have the full rights of sons. You're no longer a slave, but a son, and since you're a son, God has made you also an heir. It's a way better position to be in. Such a powerful word, this word, redeemed. Legally purchased for the due price. Good stuff. It is number 1805 in the New Testament. Number 1805, if you want to do a study on that word. The next one, if you're ready for the spelling, it is A G O R A. Z O. This word means to frequent the marketplace, to buy in the marketplace. I had to do a little more looking up. Some, some of the commentaries said this. That figuratively Christ is said to have purchased us and made us his. He purchased us and made us his. Another one said, taking us from the marketplace into his own permanent possession. We are now his own permanent possession. Why? He bought us out. He bought us out of the marketplace. We are no longer for sale to anything. We are no longer at the mercy of anything. We can no longer be used by somebody else if we will realize that we have been redeemed and that we have been bought to be a possession, a permanent possession of his. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If y'all will meditate on these words, I'm telling you. I was believing for my health today, and so when I walked in, I told Tanya, redeemed from the curse. That is the title. <laughs> when you read this, oh my goodness, when you study these words, they're so powerful. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, I'm reading out of the King James Version. Most of you know this one, and boy, this is a powerful verse. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? If you're having a trouble with a weakness, you're having trouble with a temptation, you're having trouble with something in your body, this is a great verse to quote over yourself. Right. What? Just look yourself in the mirror. Braden says that word what a lot. What? Do you not know? Do you not know that your body? See, a lot of times we think about the price that Jesus paid being for our spirits, and we don't give him our body. He bought our body. He bought our body with his body. Our body is his. What? Know you not that your, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Just meditate on that. That body. What, you know, everybody wants to study the Ark of the Covenant. It's a great study. You are that Ark. Right. You now hold the presence of God. If, if anything, I hate to use the word evil. If anything natural touched that Ark, 
What happened? It's going to die. Then what cell? What germ? What bacteria? What virus? What flu? What, what enemy? You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. He bought you for that. You're not your own. I'm not my own. I have a right to do with this body what I want to do with it. It's not mine. It's been purchased. It's been redeemed. It's been bought up by a good father. For you are bought with a price. That, that phrase, bought with a price, is this Greek word. It's number 59 in the New Testament. The A-G word. That is that word. For you are bought, redeemed, ransomed. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They're both God's. He paid for them both. They're both his. My body is not available anymore. Sickness can't possess it. I got tickled. I almost, almost titled tonight, I'm possessed. <laughs> but I was a little concerned of what it might look like on the internet. Might be used against me in a court of law somewhere, so I decided I better not say it. Sickness can't possess my body. I'm possessed. He bought me, paid for my body. Sin can't master my body. I'm possessed. I have a master. He bought me. He bought me to free me. He bought me to love me. He bought me to make me everything that he's intended for me to be from the beginning. It has been bought with a price. Not just my spirit, but my body. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This Greek word purchased, used here in a phrase, but basically it means the word purchased. It's also found in the following scriptures, and you can study these later. 1 Corinthians 7, 23. Revelations, sorry, Revelation 14, verses 3 and 4. Now, how I found those was that Englishman's concordance. When I put in number 59, it showed me where all it was used. But I've got to read this one to you from Revelation 5. It is so beautiful, and it really illustrates what this word means. Revelation 5, verse 9, I'm reading out of the NIV. This is a scene in heaven. You remember when we studied the book of Revelation, the opening of the seals? Refers to that here. I'm giving you time to get there. Revelation 5. You should know where the book of Revelation is. Right before maps and at the end. All right, you ready? It says, and they sang a new song. This is the song they sang. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God. From every tribe, every language, and people, and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. This is what you're purchased to. And, and this is really one of the last statements I was going to cover tonight. It's not just what you're redeemed from, but it's what you're redeemed to. When the curse is removed, who does that make you? This tells you. He, he purchased... With his blood, he purchased men for God. From every tribe, every language, every people, every nation, to make them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. You were redeemed from the curse, and this is what you were redeemed to. You weren't just bought and set on the streets. I was thinking about uh, the days of, of slavery in America. And one of the biggest problems that happened... When President Lincoln freed the slaves, first of all, the biggest problem was they didn't know they were freed. Nobody told them. That's our job. When we see somebody bound in captivity to anything, sickness, disease, oppression, anything, you're freed. I love T.D. Jakes. Woman, thou art loosed. What, what are you doing bound? You're loosed. Ought not this daughter of Abraham be loosed who has been bound? They didn't know they were free. And if they did get word that they were free, they had no idea how to live free. 
We've got to learn how to live free. Stand, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free, and don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. One version of that says, I can't remember where that is, I think it's in Galatians. Do you remember? Anybody remember? It's in there. Somebody will be looking it up. Stand, therefore, in the liberty. It says, stand ye, therefore, as free men. I think it's the Message Bible that says it that way. Stand as free men. How do, st- how do free men stand? They know who they are and they know their rights. And they will not settle to be slaves when we are free. It's the greatest thing about America. Don't oppress us. We're free. We know what freedom is. We know what our rights are. We have a constitution. That came from God. He set that example. That Bible is our constitution. It's our book of rights. It's our book of privilege. It states who we are. And we should not settle for anything less than freedom. Who found that? Galatians 5. 1 5. Galatians 1 5. Thank you. 5 1. Galatians 5 1. That's a good verse. I should have put that in here. Another word you'll find. Ready for the spelling? I'm going to pronounce this one because I hit the pronunciation button on one of them and it told me how. I thought it sounded like a medical commercial. You know, all those commercials you see. Lutrosis. L-U-T-R-O-S-I-S. L-U-T-R-O-S-I-S. Lutrosis. It means ransoming. A redemption from the penalty of sin. Bringing deliverance from the guilt of and the power of sin. Ever needed freedom from the guilt of sin? Just as much as you did from the act of sin? That's what this word means. He redeemed you from that. Redeemed you from the guilt of sin. The root word, which is latrue, L-U-T-R-O-O, means to untie, to loosen, and to unbind. You are not tied to that anymore. You hear me? You're not tied to it anymore. We just thank God for your testimony you gave me back there a while ago. You're not tied to that anymore. And when we realize we're not tied to that sin anymore, the guilt leaves. It leaves. If you're feeling guilt from the sin that you've been forgiven from, you're, tied, you're still tied to that thing. And he redeemed you. He untied you. You are no longer bound to it. He has loosened you. From the penalty and from the guilt of it. Now this word, lutrosis, man, oh, I'm going to have to read sideways because this was a last minute note that I found online. He said, this word ransoming or redemption is a, tr- is a transaction that you would find in the Old Testament where the patriarch of a family would trade something of value for a possession or person who rightfully belonged to the family by natural means. But they'd been taken captive. I naturally belong to God by natural means. He is my creator. He is my creator, and he was willing to give something up to get me back into the family that I belong in. He is the ultimate patriarch. I liked that. I thought that was a good bit of history there. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Oh man, the clock is gone. Thank you. Hebrews chapter 9. And I apologize, I didn't write down which version I, I used on this. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Speaking of Jesus, and it says, He did not enter in to the Holy of Holies, by means of the blood of goats and calves, like they did in the Old Testament, which was just a covering. It was just a covering to cover them for the time. Then they had to do it again. But he entered the most holy place once for all. There is no more sacrifice needed to cover your sin because it's not covered anymore. It's removed. There doesn't have to be another one. 
once and for all by his blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Having obtained eternal, and I'm going to put the definition in this, having obtained eternal ransoming, having obtained a redemption from the penalty of sin, having, having obtained the deliverance through his death from the guilt and the power of sin. He obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who were ceremonially unclean sanctified them so that they were outwardly clean. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death? How much more will his blood cleanse our consciences? You got a trouble with guilt? You need to study the blood. Hebrews is a good place to do it. Study the blood. It will cleanse your conscience from the acts that lead to death, that separation from God, so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. There's that inheritance word we talked about Sunday. Now that he has died as a ransom. That's number 3085. 3085, this word latrosis. Now that he has died as a ransom. I'm sorry, I, I told you that wrong on that one. We'll go, to, we'll go to that one in a minute. To set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. He died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. It is his blood cleansed it. He took on your sin nature. He took on the penalty for your sin, which was death. He had to die. He had to go into the heart of the earth. If he didn't go into the heart of the earth, we would have to go into the heart of the earth. He did that for us. He covered. He carried our penalty. The wage of our sin was death. He died that death. We don't have to live dead. We're alive to God. That's the good news of the gospel. This word, latrosis, which we found up in verse 12, is also used in Luke 1, 68, and in Luke 2, 38. Now, where I messed up was in verse 15. That word ransom is a different word, which is the word we're fixing to cover. Let me ready for the spelling. This is a long one. A P O L U T R O S I S. A P O L U T R O S I S. It means to let one go free on receiving the price. I really liked it. Oh, this one was such a good one. A releasing affected by payment of ransom. I'll reread these. Liberation procured by the payment of a ransom. Ransom in full. This is, you can write this one right here down and get the whole thing. A price of release. This is what he did. He redeemed you. He paid the price of release. All the way through there. Liberation. Liberty, release, those, those words. This is what this word redemption means here. It also means the liberation from guilt and the doom of sin and the introduction into a life of liberty. See, it's not just what he redeemed us from. It's what he redeemed us to that's so beautiful. You can find this word also used in Luke 21, 28. Romans 3, 24. And Ephesians 1 7. For this one, we're going to look at Colossians 1 12. Of course, you had an example in the scripture that we read above from Hebrews 9. But Colossians 1, and this will be the last one we cover tonight. Because there's more. His word is redemption from Genesis to the book of Revelation. That's what it is. From the minute man messed up, God made, started making plans. 
took the blood, killed innocent animals to cover man. As soon as they sinned, didn't waste any time, make it a way for redemption, making a type for redemption. It's the kind of God we serve. He's our Father. Colossians 1, verse 12, King James Version. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet or able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. There's our inheritance again. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his, of his dear Son. Here we can see that definition of him setting us free and introducing us into a life of liberty. This, this whole thing is about that. Verse 14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. I want to read this to you out of the Amplified. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified and made us fit to share the portion which is the inheritance of the saints, of God's holy people in the light. The Father has delivered and drawn us to himself out of the control and out of the dominion of darkness. What is any area of your life doing in darkness? You know, if you battle oppression or depression, that's darkness. And we've all experienced it at some time in our lives. Some people have a, have a lasting uh, years and years and years of a battle with this. This is a great verse for you. He has drawn us to himself out of the control and out of the dominion of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. He didn't just redeem us from darkness and leave us out there like the slaves who didn't know anything to do, what to do with themselves once they were free. They had nowhere to go, so you know what they did? They kept serving where they were even though they were free. This is where Christians have stayed, haven't realized that their redemption hasn't just redeemed them from the curse, it has transferred them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of God's dear Son. We're not supposed to just sit there and keep serving darkness when... We've been redeemed from it, but we don't know what to do. He has a place for us. You can find it in the Word. It'll tell you how to live. It'll tell you how, how to be free. Might be next week's lesson, huh? How to be free. The Father has delivered and drawn them unto himself out of the control of the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Verse 14, in whom we have our redemption through his blood which means the forgiveness of our sins. That's just powerful to me. Not just redeemed out of something, but redeemed and brought and bought to something. I want to end with Psalm 107, verse 2. You can just listen because you know it if you want to. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Why is that important? Because if you were a slave and you have been redeemed, the old master doesn't give up easy. So if you're redeemed, you need to be saying so. And when something else tries to take hold of your body, or something else tries to take hold of your mind, let the redeemed of the Lord say, Oh no, I'm redeemed. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. The enemy has no right to you anymore. And if we could just get it through our heads that he doesn't even have any right to our wrongs. He doesn't. If, if Merle was my slave master and I was her slave and I did wrong and she would beat me or correct me or punish me as they often did back then. But Tanya bought me and took me from Merle's place into her place, and I do wrong, what business is it of yours? None. You've been moved. You've been removed from the hand of the enemy. He has no right, even in your wrongs. Amen? Y'all can stand. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.